The Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 3, by Edgar Allan Poe. The Spectacles, Part 2. I replied as best I could, as only a true lover can. I spoke at length and perseveringly of my devotion, of my passion, of her exceeding beauty, and of my own enthusiastic admiration. In conclusion, I dwelt, with a convincing energy, upon the perils that encompass the course of love, that course of true love that never did run smooth, and thus deduced the manifest danger of rendering that course unnecessarily long. This latter argument seemed finally to soften the rigor of her determination. She relented, but there was yet an obstacle, she said, which she felt assured I had not properly considered. This was a delicate point, for a woman to urge, especially so. In mentioning it, she saw that she must make a sacrifice of her feelings. Still, for me, every sacrifice should be made. She alluded to the topic of age. Was I aware, was I fully aware, of the discrepancy between us, that the age of the husband should surpass by a few years, even by fifteen or twenty, the age of the wife, was regarded by the world as admissible, and, indeed, as even proper? But she had always entertained the belief that the years of the wife should never exceed in number those of the husband. A discrepancy of this unnatural kind gave rise, too frequently, alas, to a life of unhappiness. Now she was aware that my own age did not exceed two and twenty, and I, on the contrary, perhaps, was not aware that the years of my Eugenie extended very considerably beyond that sum. About all this there was a nobility of soul, a dignity of candor, which delighted, which enchanted me, which eternally riveted my chains. I could scarcely restrain the excessive transport which possessed me. "'My Swedish Eugenie,' I cried, "'what is all this about which you are discoursing? "'Your years surpass in some measure my own. "'But what then? "'The customs of the world are so many conventional follies. "'To those who love as ourselves, "'in what respect differs a year from an hour? "'I am twenty-two, you say. "'Granted. "'Indeed, you may as well call me at once twenty-three. "'Now, you yourself, my dearest Eugenie, "'can have numbered no more than can have numbered no more than, no more than, 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 than. Here I paused for an instant, in the expectation that Madame Lalande would interrupt me by supplying her true age. But a French woman is seldom direct, and has always, by way of answer to an embarrassing query, some little practical reply of her own. In the present instance, Eugenie who, for a few moments past, had seemed to be searching for something in her bosom, at length let fall upon the grass a miniature, which I immediately picked up and presented to her. "'Keep it,' she said, with one of her most ravishing smiles. "'Keep it for my sake, for the sake of her whom it too flatteringly represents. Besides, upon the back of the trinket you may discover, perhaps, the very information you seem to desire. It is now, to be sure, growing rather dark.' but you can examine it at your leisure in the morning. In the meantime, you shall be my escort home tonight. My friends are about holding a little musical levee. I can promise you, too, some good singing. We French are not nearly so punctilious as you Americans, and I shall have no difficulty in smuggling you in, in the character of an old acquaintance. With this, she took my arm, and I attended her home. The mansion was quite a fine one, and, I believe, furnished in good taste. Of this latter point, however, I am scarcely qualified to judge, for it was just dark as we arrived, and in American mansions of the better sort, lights seldom, during the heat of summer, make their appearance at this the most pleasant period of the day. In about an hour after my arrival, to be sure, a single shaded solar lamp was lit in the principal drawing-room and this apartment, I could thus see, was arranged with unusual good taste and even splendor. But two other rooms of the suite, and in which the company chiefly assembled, remained during the whole evening in a very agreeable shadow. This is a well-conceived custom, giving the party at least a choice of light or shade, and one which our friends over the water could not do better than immediately adopt. The evening thus spent was unquestionably the most delicious of my life. 
Madame Lalande had not overrated the musical abilities of her friends, and the singing I here heard I had never heard excelled in any private circle out of Vienna. The instrumental performers were many and of superior talents. The vocalists were chiefly ladies, and no individual sang less than well. At length, upon a peremptory call for Madame Lalande, she arose at once, without affectation or demur, from the chaise longue upon which she had sat by my side, and, accompanied by one or two gentlemen and her female friend of the opera, repaired to the piano in the main drawing-room. I would have escorted her myself, but felt that, under the circumstances of my introduction to the house, I had better remain unobserved where I was. I was thus deprived of the pleasure of seeing, although not of hearing, her sing. The impression she produced upon the company seemed electrical, but the effect upon myself was something even more. I know not how adequately to describe it. It arose in part, no doubt, from the sentiment of love with which I was imbued, but chiefly from my conviction of the extreme sensibility of the singer. It is beyond the reach of art to endow either air or recitative with more impassioned expression than was hers. Her utterance of the romance in Otello, the tone with which she gave the words Sul mio sasso in the Capuletti, is ringing in my memory yet. Her lower tones were absolutely miraculous. Her voice embraced three complete octaves, extending from the contralto D to the D upper soprano, and, though sufficiently powerful to have filled the San Carlos, executed with the minutest precision every difficulty of vocal composition, ascending and descending scales, cadences, or fioriturri. In the final of the Somnambula, she brought about a most remarkable effect at the words, A non giunge uman pensiero al contento onio son piena. Here, in imitation of Malibran, she modified the original phrase of Bellini, so as to let her voice descend to the tenor G, when, by a rapid transition, she struck the G above the treble stave, springing over an interval of two octaves. Upon rising from the piano, after these miracles of vocal execution, she resumed her seat by my side. When I expressed to her, in terms of the deepest enthusiasm, my delight at her performance. Of my surprise I said nothing, and yet I was most unfeignedly surprised, for a certain feebleness, or, or rather a certain tremulous indecision of voice in ordinary conversation, had prepared me to anticipate that, in singing, she would not acquit herself with any remarkable ability. Our conversation was now long, earnest, uninterrupted, and totally unreserved. She made me relate many of the earlier passages of my life, and listened with breathless attention to every word of the narrative. I concealed nothing, felt that I had a right to conceal nothing from her confiding affection. Encouraged by her candor upon the delicate point of her age, I entered, with perfect frankness, not only into a detail of my many minor vices, but made full confession of those moral and even of those physical infirmities, the disclosure of which, in demanding so much higher a degree of courage, is so much surer an evidence of love. I touched upon my college indiscretions, upon my extravagances, upon my carousals, upon my debts, upon my flirtations. I even went so far as to speak of a slightly hectic cough with which, at one time, I had been troubled, of a chronic rheumatism, of a twinge of hereditary gout, and, in conclusion, of the disagreeable and inconvenient but hitherto carefully concealed weakness of my eyes. Upon this latter point, said Madame Lalande, laughingly, you have been surely injudicious in coming to confession, for without the confession I take it for granted that no one would have accused you of the crime. By the by, she continued, have you any recollection? And here I fancied that a blush, even through the gloom of the apartment, became distinctly visible upon her cheek. Have you any recollection, mon cher ami, of this little ocular assistant which now depends from my neck? As she spoke, she twirled in her fingers the identical double eyeglass which had so overwhelmed me with confusion at the opera. "'Full well, alas, do I remember it!' I exclaimed, pressing passionately the delicate hand which offered the glasses for my inspection. 
they formed a complex and magnificent toy, richly chased and filigreed and gleaming with jewels, which, even in the deficient light, I could not help perceiving were of high value. "'Eh bien, mon ami,' she resumed with a certain impressment of manner that rather surprised me, "'eh bien, mon ami, you have earnestly besought of me a favor, which you have been pleased to denominate priceless. You have demanded of me my hand upon the morrow. Should I yield to your entreaties, and, I may add, to the pleadings of my own bosom, would I not be entitled to demand of you a very, a very little boon in return?' "'Name it!' I exclaimed, with an energy that had nearly drawn upon us the observation of the company, and restrained by their presence alone from throwing myself impetuously at her feet. "'Name it, my beloved, my Eugenie, my own, name it! But, alas, it is already yielded ere named!' "'You shall conquer, then, mon ami,' said she. "'For the sake of the Eugenie whom you love, this little weakness which you have at last confessed.' this weakness more moral than physical, and which, let me assure you, is so unbecoming the nobility of your real nature, so inconsistent with the candor of your usual character, and which, if permitted further control, will assuredly involve you sooner or later in some very disagreeable scrape. You shall conquer for my sake this affectation which leads you, as you yourself acknowledge to the tacit or implied denial of your infirmity of vision, for this infirmity you virtually deny in refusing to employ the customary means for its relief. You will understand me to say, then, that I wish you to wear spectacles. Ah, hush! You have already consented to wear them for my sake. You shall accept the little toy which I now hold in my hand, and which, though admirable as an aid to vision, is really of no very immense value as a gem. You perceive that, by a trifling modification, thus, or thus, it can be adapted to the eyes in the form of spectacles, or worn in the waistcoat pocket as an eyeglass. It is in the former mode, however, and habitually, that you have already consented to wear it for my sake. This request, must I confess it, confused me in no little degree. But the condition with which it was coupled rendered hesitation, of course, a matter altogether out of the question. "'It is done!' I cried, with all the enthusiasm that I could muster at the moment. "'It is done. It is most cheerfully agreed. I sacrifice every feeling for your sake. Tonight I wear this dear eyeglass as an eyeglass, and upon my heart. But with the earliest dawn of that morning which gives me the pleasure of calling you wife, I will place it upon my upon my nose, and there wear it, ever afterward, in the less romantic and less fashionable, but certainly in the more serviceable form which you desire. Our conversation now turned upon the details of our arrangements for the morrow. Talbot, I learned from my betrothed, had just arrived in town. I was to see him at once and procure a carriage. The soiree would scarcely break up before two— and by this hour the vehicle was to be at the door when, in the confusion occasioned by the departure of the company, Madame L. could easily enter it unobserved. We were then to call at the house of a clergyman who would be in waiting, there be married, drop Talbot, and proceed upon a short tour to the east, leaving the fashionable world at home to make whatever comments upon the matter it thought best. Having planned all this, I immediately took leave and went in search of Talbot, but on the way I could not refrain from stepping into a hotel for the purpose of inspecting the miniature. And this I did by the powerful aid of the glasses. The countenance was a surpassingly beautiful one, those large luminous eyes, that proud Grecian nose, those dark luxuriant curls. Ah, said I exultingly to myself, this is indeed the speaking image of my beloved. I turned the reverse and discovered the words, Eugenie Lalonde, aged twenty-seven years and seven months. I found Talbot at home, and proceeded at once to acquaint him with my good fortune. He professed excessive astonishment, of course, but congratulated me most cordially, and proffered every assistance in his power. In a word, we carried out our arrangement to the letter, and at two in the morning, just ten minutes after the ceremony, I found myself in a close carriage, 
with Madame Lalande, with Mrs. Simpson, I should say, and driving at a great rate out of town in a direction northeast by north half north. It had been determined for us by Talbot that, as we were to be up all night, we should make our first stop at C, a village about twenty miles from the city, and there get an early breakfast and some repose before proceeding upon our route. At four precisely, therefore, the carriage drew up at the door of the principal inn. I handed my adored wife out and ordered breakfast forthwith. In the meantime, we were shown into a small parlor and sat down. It was now nearly, if not altogether, daylight, and as I gazed enraptured at the angel by my side, the singular idea came all at once into my head that this was really the very first moment since my acquaintance with the celebrated loveliness of Madame Lalande that I had enjoyed a near inspection of that loveliness by daylight at all. And now, mon ami, said she, taking my hand and so interrupting this train of reflection, and now, mon cher ami, since we are indissolubly one, since I have yielded to your passionate entreaties and performed my portion of our agreement, I presume you have not forgotten that you have also a little favor to bestow, a little promise which it is your intention to keep. Ah, let me see, let me remember. Yes, full easily do I call to mind the precise words of the dear promise you made to Eugenie last night. Listen, you spoke thus. It is done, it is most cheerfully agreed, I sacrifice every feeling for your sake. Tonight I wear this dear eyeglass as an eyeglass, and upon my heart. But with the earliest dawn of that morning which gives me the privilege of calling you wife, I will place it upon my, upon my nose, and there wear it ever afterward in the less romantic and less fashionable, but certainly in the more serviceable form which you desire. These were the exact words, my beloved husband, were they not? They were, I said. You have an excellent memory. And assuredly, my beautiful Eugenie, there is no disposition on my part to evade the performance of the trivial promise they imply. See, behold, they are becoming, rather, are they not? And here, having arranged the glasses in the ordinary form of spectacles, I applied them gingerly in their proper position. While Madame Simpson, adjusting her cap and folding her arms, sat bolt upright in her chair, in a somewhat stiff and prim, and indeed in a somewhat undignified position. "'Goodness gracious me!' I exclaimed, almost at the very instant that the rim of the spectacles had settled upon my nose. "'My goodness gracious me! Why, what can be the matter with these glasses?' And taking them quickly off, I wiped them carefully with a silk handkerchief and adjusted them again. But if, in the first instance, there had occurred something which occasioned me surprise, in the second this surprise became elevated into astonishment, and this astonishment was profound, was extreme, indeed, I may say, it was horrific. What, in the name of everything hideous, did this mean? Could I believe my eyes? Could I? That was the question. Was that... Was that, was that rouge? And were those, and were those, were those wrinkles upon the visage of Eugenie Lalande? And oh, Jupiter and every one of the gods and goddesses, little and big, what, 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 what had become of her teeth? I dashed the spectacles violently to the ground and leaping to my feet stood erect in the middle of the floor, confronting Mrs. Simpson with my arms set akimbo and grinning and foaming, but at the same time utterly speechless with terror and with rage. Now, I have already said that Madame Eugenie Lalande, that is to say, uh, Simpson, spoke the English language but very little better than she wrote it, and for this reason... She very properly never attempted to speak it upon ordinary occasions. But rage will carry a lady to any extreme, and in the present case it carried Mrs. Simpson to the very extraordinary extreme of attempting to hold a conversation in a tongue that she did not altogether understand. "'Well, monsieur,' said she, after surveying me, in great apparent astonishment for some moments, "'Well, monsieur, and va then, va de matter now?' Is it the dance of the Saint Vitus that you have? If not like me, what for why buy the pig in the poke? 
"'You wretch!' said I, catching my breath. "'You, you, you villainous old hag!' "'Ag? Ol? Me not so ver old, after all. Me not one single day more than the eighty-two. Eighty-two? I ejaculated, staggering to the wall. Eighty-two hundred thousand baboons! The miniature said twenty-seven years and seven months. To be sure, that is so ver true, but then the portrait has been take for these uh, fifty-five year. When I go marry my second husband, Monsieur Lalande, at that time I had the portrait taken for my daughter by my first husband, Monsieur Moissart. Moissart, said I. Yes, Moissart, said she, mimicking my pronunciation, which, to speak the truth, was none of the best. And what then? What you know about the Moissart? Nothing, you old fright. I know nothing about him at all. Only I had an ancestor of that name once upon a time. That name? And what you have for to say to that name? Tis very good name. And so is Voissart. That is very good name too. My daughter, Madame Moissart, she married Monsieur Voissart, and the name is both very respectable name. Moissart? I exclaimed, and Voissart. Why, what is it you mean? What I mean? I mean Moissart and Voissart, and for the matter of that, I mean Croissart and Foissart too, if I only think proper to mean it. My daughter's daughter, Mademoiselle Voissart, she married von Monsieur Croissart, and then again, my daughter's granddaughter, Mademoiselle Croissart, she married von Monsieur Foissart, and I suppose you say that that is not one very respectable name? Froissart, said I, beginning to faint. Why, surely you don't say Moissart and Voissart and Croissart and Froissart? Yes, she replied, leaning back fully in her chair and stretching out her lower limbs at great length. Yes, Moissart and Voissart and Croissart and Foissart. But Monsieur Foissart, he was one very big, what you call, fool. He was one very great big dance, like yourself, for he left La Belle France for to come to this stupid Amérique. And when he get here, he went to have one very stupid, one very, very stupid son. So I hear, though I not yet have had the plaisir to meet with him. Neither me nor my companion de Madame Stephanie Lalonde. He is named the Napoleon Bonaparte Foissart. And I suppose you say that that, too, is not a very respectable name. Either the length or the nature of this speech had the effect of working up Mrs. Simpson into a very extraordinary passion indeed. And as she made an end of it, with great labor she lumped up from her chair like somebody bewitched, dropping upon the floor an entire universe of bustle as she lumped. Once upon her feet, she gnashed her gums, brandished her arms, rolled up her sleeves, shook her fist in my face, and concluded the performance by tearing the cap from her head, and with it an immense wig of the most valuable and beautiful black hair, the whole of which she dashed upon the ground with a yell, and there trampled and danced a fandango upon it in an absolute ecstasy and agony of rage. Meantime I sank aghast into the chair which she had vacated. Moissart and Voissart, I repeated thoughtfully as she cut one of her pigeon wings, and Croissart and Froissart as she completed another, Moissart and Voissart and Croissart, and Napoleon Bonaparte Froissart. Why, you inevitable old servant, that's me, that's me, do you hear? That's me! Here I screamed at the top of my voice, That's me! I am Napoleon Bonaparte Froissart! And if I haven't married my great-great-grandmother, I wish I may be everlastingly confounded. Madame Eugénie Lalonde, quasi-Simpson, formerly Moissart, was, in sober fact, my great-great-grandmother. In her youth, she had been beautiful, and even at eighty-two retained the majestic height, the sculptural contour of head, the fine eyes and the Grecian nose of her girlhood. By the aid of these of pearl powder, of rouge, of false hair, false teeth, and false tournure, as well as of the most skillful modistes of Paris, 
she contrived to hold a respectable footing among the beauties en peu passé of the French metropolis. In this respect, indeed, she might have been regarded as little less than the equal of the celebrated Ninon de L'Enclos. She was immensely wealthy, and being left, for the second time, a widow without children, she bethought herself of my existence in America, and, for the purpose of making me her heir, paid a visit to the United States, in company with a distant and exceedingly lovely relative of her second husband's, a Madame Stephanie Lalonde. At the opera, my great-great-grandmother's attention was arrested by my notice, and, upon surveying me through her eyeglass, she was struck with a certain family resemblance to herself. Thus interested, and knowing that the heir she sought was actually in the city, she made inquiries of her party respecting me. The gentleman who attended her knew my person and told her who I was. The information thus obtained induced her to renew her scrutiny, and this scrutiny it was which so emboldened me that I behaved in the absurd manner already detailed. She returned my bow, however, under the impression that by some odd accident I had discovered her identity. When deceived by my weakness of vision and the arts of the toilet in respect to the age and charms of this strange lady, I demanded so enthusiastically of Talbot who she was, he concluded that I meant the younger beauty as a matter of course, and so informed me with perfect truth that she was the celebrated widow Madame Lalonde. In the street next morning my great-great-grandmother encountered Talbot, an old Parisian acquaintance, and the conversation very naturally turned upon myself. My deficiencies of vision were then explained, for these were notorious, although I was entirely ignorant of their notoriety, and my good old relative discovered, much to her chagrin, that she had been deceived in supposing me aware of her identity, and that I had merely been making a fool of myself in making open love in a theatre to an old woman unknown. By way of punishing me for this imprudence, she concocted with Talbot a plot. He purposely kept out of my way to avoid giving me the introduction. My street inquiries about the lovely widow, Madame Lalande, were supposed to refer to the younger lady, of course, and thus the conversation with the three gentlemen whom I encountered shortly after leaving Talbot's hotel will be easily explained, as also their allusion to Ninon de L'Enclos. I had no opportunity of seeing Madame Lalande closely during daylight, and, at her musical soiree, my silly weakness in refusing the aid of glasses effectually prevented me from making a discovery of her age. When Madame Lalande was called upon to sing, the younger lady was intended, and it was she who rose to obey the call, my great-great-grandmother, to further the deception, arising at the same moment and accompanying her to the piano in the main drawing-room. Had I decided upon escorting her thither, it had been her design to suggest the propriety of my remaining where I was, but my own prudential views rendered this unnecessary. The songs which I so much admired, and which so confirmed my impression of the youth of my mistress, were executed by Madame Stephanie Lalande. The eyeglass was presented by way of adding a reproof to the hoax, a sting to the epigram of the deception. Its presentation afforded an opportunity for the lecture upon affectation with which I was so especially edified. It is almost superfluous to add that the glasses of the instrument, as worn by the old lady, had been exchanged by her for a pair better adapted to my years. They suited me, in fact, to a T. The clergyman, who merely pretended to tie the fatal knot, was a boon companion of Talbot's and no priest. He was an excellent whip, however, and having doffed his cassock to put on a great coat, he drove the hack, which conveyed the happy couple out of town. Talbot took a seat at his side. The two scoundrels were thus in at the death, and through a half-open window of the back parlor of the inn amused themselves in grinning at the denouement of the drama. I believe I shall be forced to call them both out. Nevertheless, I am not the husband of my great-great-grandmother and this is a reflection which affords me infinite relief. But I am the husband of Madame Lalande, of Madame Stephanie Lalande, with whom my good old relative, besides making me her sole heir when she dies, if she ever does, has been at the trouble of concocting me a match. In conclusion, I am done forever with billets doux, and I am never to be met without spectacles.'